So hello, everybody. Uh, Tim Nedwett here. Um, we're starting our webinar series. Uh, Dagmar Etkin is going to speak today, and I'll introduce her in a minute. But uh, let's give a couple minutes while uh, while the participants come into this Zoom meeting room, and then uh, we'll get started in maybe a minute or so. I'll mention while people are coming in that I'm going to be doing the all the hosting duties myself because Lin Zhao, who usually helps me, is uh, a bit under the weather uh, this morning. Um, so let's hope she gets she gets better. Uh, but that leaves me and that leaves me in sole charge here. Okay, well, look, look, it's slowing down on the participants entering. So why don't we, why don't we get started? Magmar, are you ready? All right, I'm going to. Yes, I am. A little, I'm going to do a little bit of introduction so we know how we're going to operate here. And I'll introduce um, that, and then I'll introduce Dagmar. So, so welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, webinar seven, and we have Dagmar Etkin, who's going to speak uh, on uh, her fascinating career. Actually, I heard part of this talk already, and it's it's going to be very interesting. So, stay tuned. Um, I need to mention that we are recording the series um, right now, and we are going to put these recordings on uh, a website that the API is maintaining. And uh, I believe the link to that, to those recordings, and I think, I think the previous five or six are already up. Um, and so you can go to that link and look at the previous recording. So hopefully you can stay and listen to the entire talk and questions um, today. But if not, you can go to the link and see uh, this recording within the near future. It usually takes us a few weeks to get things put together and up um, on board. Um, so as we've mentioned before, what the goal of this, this webinar series, and we're holding it once a month, is to allow seasoned experts in the oil spill response field to pass on their knowledge, right? I've realized during COVID lockdowns that, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of expertise has been retiring inside ExxonMobil and inside industry. I'm not saying Dagmar's retired or is getting close to retirement, um, but she has a lot of experience and it's important for us to try to take the lessons learned from those, uh, those experienced individuals um, and pass them on to the people who are coming up in the oil spill response field. So I mentioned we're gonna do that. We do this on a monthly basis and it's every Tuesday and it starts at 10 a.m. Houston time or central central time. So it's the first Tuesday of every month. Um, we may change the June uh, version. So if David Dickens is listening, uh, that that's um, conflicts with uh, the first day of AMOP. Right? I'll be at AMOP. We may lose people. So we may, we may postpone the June session. Just be aware of that. But we haven't made a decision on when that. And I'll just mention that we're going to continue this webinar series. We're getting a lot of interest. A lot of people tune in to it, which is great. Um, there's no restriction on who can attend. So if anyone who's listening knows of someone that, that might be interested in attending, send, uh, send me or Lin Zhao his, that person's email and uh, we'll put them on the list and send them and send them the invite. Okay, so we're gonna talk, we're gonna allow Dagmar to talk for an hour and then we'll have 15 to 30 minutes of, of questions afterward. The way to ask questions is there's a Q&A button um, so log your questions uh, during the talk as they come to you, um, and then at the end, after Dagmar has finished speaking, we'll uh, we'll go. I'll go through the list of questions and ask, and Dagmar will answer as many as as possible in the in the 15 minutes to half hour um, that we had that we have for that. Okay, I mentioned the recordings will be released soon. I'm going to introduce Dagmar in just a second, um, but I wanted to mention that we have next month's speaker. So this is April, so May's speaker. Um, will be, we have a triumvirate of Dr. Michael Zaccardi from the University of California, um, Paul Kelway, who works at Oil Spill Response Limited, and our own Rich Davey, who works for ExxonMobil. 
Um, they're going to provide their uh, knowledge and expertise on uh, wildlife response and rehab. So stay tuned for that. And Lynn will send out the invite with more details on, on that talk um, soon. So we have, I think the bio, I think a short bio that, of Dagmar's went out. Um, I, so I won't go through that. Everyone can read that. So Dagmar has probably the, I, I, I guarantee she has the largest database of oil spill response case histories. And she does a lot of work on spill statistics um, so we can understand the risks, so both the probability and consequences of, of oil spills worldwide. And Dagmar's done a lot of work. She's made, she has a lot of publications, and uh, she's going to speak um, to that. I, I'll just say one more thing before I turn to Dagmar. I, I, I used to watch David Letterman back in the 80s, and he, whenever he'd have a guest, there'd be certain guests that you knew were his friend. And he'd say that that person is a friend of the show. Well, Dagmar is a friend of the webinar series. So Dagmar, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, thanks. Thank you so much, Tim. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So anyway, here's, here's my, I'm, I'm talking about learning from pat, the patterns in oil spill data, but I wanna back up a bit and just tell you a little bit about how I got there. Let's see if I can, there we go. How did I get to working on oil spills for 40 years? And actually this year it is 40 years because nobody wakes up one day and decides to become an oil spill expert. It certainly didn't happen that way for me. I was going to be a biologist from the time I was a little girl, poking in the dirt, planting seeds, wading in woodland ponds, looking for crayfish, collecting and dissecting. At Harvard, I studied with some of the greatest minds in the biological sciences, Stephen Jay Gould, Dick Lewinton, E.O. Wilson, who just died recently. I learned critical thinking and I looked at problems from all different angles. To make money, I did a, little, a lot of statistics for, for Harvard professors, you know, getting them set up on what sort of, how they should set up their, their experiments and so forth. And I also did uh, all sorts of uh, translations from German scientific literature, German being my first language. Directly and indirectly, I delved into all kinds of sciences, looking for patterns in ecological systems and populations. I was all set to go into the happily ever after as an ecological modeler or maybe an, eco an economic botanist. And then, well, I needed some money and uh, a friend of, I was doing some teaching at Harvard after I got my, my PhD, um, but I needed a little more money. Uh, and uh, I had a friend who, from Harvard who was working with the Smithsonian, in, Smithsonian Institute for short-lived phenomena. And they were tracking oil spills among other things like volcanoes and hurricanes and things like that. So I did some analyses for that. And to be perfectly honest, I thought it was really dreadful. But I did learn that there were a lot of oil spills going on that I had never heard about. And then, well, to make a long story short, uh, an academic career and motherhood were not compatible, at least in those days. Um, my sons just turned 41 and 37 in the last few days, actually. When I went to work, I figured I'd help those poor people at the oil spill intelligence report on those dreadful oil spill stats until something better came along, a few months or so. And then for a report that I was writing for them, actually it was on cold water oil spills, I had to interview this guy named Al Allen. And then shortly thereafter, I had to interview another guy named David Dickens. I began to wonder if they all had you know, names with the same first and last initial. <laughs> anyway, but talking to Al and then talking to Dave, I became completely mesmerized. I, I found out that this stuff was really, really interesting and that there were ways that all of the different sciences that I had, that I had studied or indirectly or directly and, and thinking and statistics and math and logic and all those things came into play. 
And I started putting myself into it with the fervor that I had with my PhD thesis research. I tried to learn everything I possibly could about oil spills. And I talked to the most interesting people and about, read about their great work. And, and then I got to go to the North Cape oil spill. It wasn't that far. I could drive down to Rhode Island. And I met Jackie Michelle giving scat lessons on the shoreline. And then I read about Debbie French McKay's oil spill modeling and NRDA research. And I was completely hooked. So there I was, so many sciences, great mentors, colleagues, and I felt as though I could maybe make a meaningful contribution. I felt constrained at Oil Spill Intelligence Report. I wanted to do things my way and I didn't like people telling me what to do. So I, became, I took the giant leap in 1999 and became an independent consultant. And I've spent a lot of time looking for patterns in oil spill data. And that's really what we're here to talk about today. So all of this oil spill data, case studies, records, uh, studies that people have done on, on the effects of spills and so forth, tell us who, what, where, when, how, and why oil spills happen. And you can answer questions like, and then what happened? Will this happen again? Why will this happen again? How bad will it be or could it be? How can this be stopped and how can the outcome be changed? So to me, it's not just numbers and it, it, it's a bunch of stories really that we can learn from. Well, as our colleague Jackie Michelle always says, she's never been to the same spill twice. And that's true, each spill is unique, but there are patterns. There are patterns in the frequencies by source, by cause, different volumes, locations. There are trends that we see um, in, in, in these frequencies and volumes, locations and causes. There are different outcomes and consequences of spills and there are correlation between the different factors. And from this, we can make useful tools for spill risk assessment, planning and cost benefit evaluation and other things. A lot of what I've done is in one way or related, in one way or another related to oil spill risk assessment. So spill risk we know is like the, the probability of something happening times the consequence. It's, it, 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 and it's a very vague sort of multiplication of those two factors. For spills, it, you know, it's how frequently do these spills happen uh, relate and, and how, how, how frequently do they occur based on their exposure. And when I'm talking about exposure here, I'm not talking about Debbie French McKay's exposure to toxins. I'm talking about exposure to situations in which you could have a spill, how many miles of pipeline, how many tanker trips, that sort of thing. On the consequences side, there are really two things going on. And, and, and for spills, we, we sort of, I split it out anyway, into spill volume. And for some people, the volume is really, that just is the consequence, whatever magnitude of that spill is. But I also think it's important to look at the impacts or effects. And those can be ecological effects, that can be cultural effects, that can be socioeconomic effects, costs. And then we can also look at spill risk mitigation. And that's also what, what I've been, been working on. How do we mitigate these spills? We can prevent them. That's working on the probability side. And that's certainly always the best way to go. Keep the horse in the barn. But if, if, the, if the horse is leaving the barn, then let's, let's talk about mitigating the, the consequences. And that can be through source control. That's reducing the amount of oil that's, that's going, that's spewing out of the well or leaking out of the tanker or coming out of the pipeline and then reducing the the impacts or adverse effects. Debbie has taught me very well, I'm supposed to say adverse effects, not impacts, um, through spill response, which is which is what many of us are are talking about in this in this seminar series, webinar series. So for oil spill probability, or the frequency of these events. There are a couple of ways to, to look at it. You can look at historical trends and then adjust those based on what, what, um, what's happening with the particular situation you're looking in. Or you can do various sort of fault tree approaches, but all of these require some type of historical data. In terms of 
historical trends, we, we can look at spill number, how, how many of these incidents happen, or spill volume, or a combination of both. And then you can look at the different rates to how many, what's the number of spills per barrels transported, or what's the volume spilled per barrel transported. And these have practical uh, applications. From, with spill number, we can start to use that to predict the future uh, of future frequency, what we're expecting might happen in the future. We can also evaluate how, how well our prevent, pre preventive measures are working, or have we reduced that frequency. Um, on the spill volume side, you're, you can use that to evaluate the environmental effects, and you can also now evaluate how uh, effective your source control measures are. You know, if you're able to cap the the, the blowout or, or shut off the pipeline or, or do a better salvage operation to, to reduce the oil that's, that's leaking out of the tanker. So I'm not going to bore you with, with numbers here. Um, there are papers you can read and I'll be happy if you don't know where they are, I'll be happy to lead you to those. Um, I'm actually writing a big paper now looking at 50 years of oil spill statistics, so some of that's going to be in here. But basically, the story's been spill frequency is down significantly, actually, despite increased transport, production, transits of tankers, and so forth. Um, but we're also seeing that more smaller spills are being uh, reported and recorded. In terms of volume, well, the input from the, the Deepwater Horizon overwhelms all other spillage. Um, but the deep water horizon is an outlier, okay? It, it's, it only represents 0.0005% of the wells since the 1980s. And the volume, um, that, that particular volume is, is, is only 0.1% of, of the cases of, of all the, all the uh, blowouts that have, have occurred. And there've only been 20 blowouts worldwide that are more than a thousand barrels. Okay, and only three since 2000. If you take out that outlier, the volume is down. So let's look at look at Deepwater Horizon as an outlier. Um, these are this is just U.S. oil industry spillage, and you know you can see that that the you know it's going on the left side. You see that's the the total volume, and everything's kind of going sort of going down but you can't really tell and then there's this giant uh, leap in in uh, 2010 that's deep water horizon and on the right what I did was I looked at well what's our average you know annual spillage in the U.S. looking at sort of in, in 10 year intervals and you can see that it's all going down if you don't count the the, um, the deep water horizon and that 319,000 barrels that's that's um actually averaged over a, over a, you know, actually that's an 11 year period there. So um, that would be just, if, if you were adding all those numbers together and now just dividing by 10, that's what, what it would come out to be for that decade. Now you gotta be careful looking at historical spill data. This is, um, these are US pipeline spills. FIMSA does a great Great job in tracking all these. It's, it's, it's great fodder for all kinds of uh, studies. Um, and so on the left, you see, you know, since 1968, those numbers, you know, they were going down. And what I have it divided here into different sizes of spills. But then all of a sudden in 2002, there's this leap. There's, it goes up, like, what's going on here? Turns out that 2002 is when, when the, the Pipeline Safety Act was implemented. And, and all of a sudden, you had to re report all those smaller spills that were not being reported before. So that would lead you to think that there are actually more spills uh, occurring. But that's not really what was going on. Now, on the right graph, you see what I've done is taken the, the 1,000 barrel and up are larger, you know, larger pipeline spills and looked at what those numbers are. And there you can actually see that there is a downward trend um, through the years. So what's happening is that you've got a, a diff different distributions of volumes, you know, so you've got, you know, I like to put things into these little volume categories, one to nine barrels, 10 to 99 and so forth. And on the left graph here, you see that there's a, the distribution is, it's, um, it's almost a, like a normal distribution with the, with the 
the hundred barrels, the hundred barrel category being being the highest, and you've got you don't but you don't have as many smaller spills. If you look at the right, that's starting in 2002 when those smaller spills were reported. Now you've got the distribution that you're probably really expecting, and that's and that's more likely to be be um, genuinely the case. Lots of smaller spills, and and each with each increasing uh, size category, the numbers are going down. Now you can play around with this and use that to figure out, well, if, if the distribution that we're seeing uh, in 2002 to 2018, if that's really you know, representative of what, what should be going on, you can sort of, you can guess uh, what, estimate what the sort of unreported spillage would be uh, for, for the earlier time period on the, on the right side. So those are, those are sort of potentially what the unreported spills uh, look would look like. You can use this to quantify the effectiveness of spill prevention. So if you look at on the left side here, we've got our pipeline spillage rate. That's how many, how much uh, is being spilled, the volume being spilled per billion barrel miles of transport. And it goes up and down because in certain years you've got you've got larger spills that, that are affecting that. But if you look at what that average spillage rate is and now apply it to the transport of, of spills um, that occur over the years, because there is a, 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 a change uh, in that, now you can see, sort of estimate what your averted spillage is. And that's a way to, to get at how good have we been at preventing spills. I did this with uh, tanker tanker spills. Excuse me, this is some um, you know, ITOP does a great job of tracking all those worldwide tanker tanker spills. And if you look at, you know, what's the amount of oil that was spilled from tankers over the years, that's what, what the blue the blue uh, bars there. That's showing what that is. Um, but it, had we been spilling at the rate we had in the, in this you know in this in the seventies. We would have, based on the amount of oil that was being transported by tanker, we would have spilled all this much more oil. So we've averted a lot of tanker spillage. In predicting, you know, future spill frequency, you can look at these historical trends and say, all right, well, let's use those trends, but let's kind of adjust them based on what we, what we, you know, we think has changed over time. Let's say, well, you know, if, if double hulls on tankers are preventing a certain kind of spill, let's apply that here and see if there's, if, if we might um, see a reduction. Another way to look at it is, is, is a fault tree. And that's where you're looking at sort of a successive probabilities of failures. How likely is the accident? And then how likely is there to be mitigation to prevent the incident? How likely is there to be oil outflow and how likely, you know, what's the likelihood of mitigation to reduce the oil outflow and so forth. And in both of these cases, you know, we're looking at the number of incidents, but now we have to apply those frequency, volume frequency distributions like, like I showed you before, because if a spill occurs, it is not necessarily going to be a deep water horizon. It's most likely going to be a much smaller spill. I've done this and I've developed models for well blowouts, tankers, pipelines, crewed by rail, offshore wind farms. Yes, they actually have oil in them too. And they also present a, uh, a potential for uh, collisions and elisions with vessels that may then have spills. Looked at sunken wrecks, non-tank vessels. And here's another, here's a little bit more about this, this these fault tree models. I mean, you, you've got a whole bunch of things that are happening and. And if we remember from our probability, you know, when you study probability in math, you know that if you have an and scenario, this has to happen and that has to happen. Now you multiply your probabilities. You know, the, 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 the tanker has to have a, a, a grounding and the double hull needs to be breached. Both of those things need to happen. Um, in some cases, you're looking at uh, or scenarios. This happens, there's either a collision or there's a grounding. And if you're looking at what, what the spill rate is, you're going to have to add those probabilities together. But all of those probabilities are, are based on some kind of historical data 
Um, and, and in some cases, there are also sort of theoretical studies that people have done. Um, you know, uh, naval architects and so forth have, have models to figure out whether the, whether the oil is going to leak out of, out of a certain tank or not. On the consequences side, ecological consequences, you know, I've done some work in that, but some of my colleagues have done much more uh, eloquent work in that. There are socioeconomic and cultural consequences of spills, as we know, and then there's costs. There's another thing that I ended up getting in. I'm not an economist, but I sure saw some patterns there. We've got different kinds of spill costs, response, third-party da uh, third damages, NRDA, you know, and depending on who, whose perspective you're looking at, there can be fines and the, the, the price of the oil itself. We can use these to quant, people want to put a dollar sign on, on those, those, um, those spills because it's, it's a way that we can measure the magnitude of the spill effect. And we do that through, through NRDA. And it's also you know, a way that we can, we can look at future potential spill magnitude and what's that, what's that, the value of that. And people use this for things like figuring out, well, does the potential spiller have enough financial backing to pay for a major spill? Um, is a potential spill worth the risk? If you now couple that with a spill probability assessment, you can go, well, do we want to risk this? How likely is that accident to happen and what's it going to cost us if it does? And we can also use it for, for things like looking at how do prevention measures compare to spill cost. I often use the response cost as a proxy for, for these other for the other costs as well, because it, it gives you in response, we're going to have to mount a more uh, expensive, complicated response for a more complicated spill that would probably have more third party damages and natural resource damages too. So it's a way to, to get at that. And over the years, I've developed a number of models. This is, this is one that I did a number of years ago. And I, I, I often find myself making these kinds of diagrams because it's the way my brain works. I see how things are connected to each other. And basically what this is telling us is that there are a number of factors that come into to, to spill costs, obviously the volume of the spill, but uh, the cultural values, the political jurisdiction in which the spill occurs, the political climate, the economic situation of where, wherever the spill occurs, the oil type, the sensitive resources at risk, the cleanup strategy that we use, and those things, they all sort of relate to each other, the season, and how clean is clean, one of our favorite questions. Some of these things are interrelated. I think that, you know, all of these red ones are, you know, how clean is clean and cultural values and all of that. Those things actually are very closely related with each other. Um, oil type and, and sensitive resources at risk and the season in which the spill occurs and the cleanup strategy we use, those things are also uh, closely related to each other. Now, I've got a pretty good handle on taking spill volume and political jurisdiction and, you know, national economies, uh, economics, oil type, sensitive resources at risk and cleanup strategy and putting those, taking those, those values, looking at the patterns in the data and then kind of come up with a number of models. And what I've learned is that there's some interesting patterns, again, back to patterns, uh, with response costs in relation to spill volume. Now, obviously, larger spills are more expensive. It's going to cost you a lot more to clean up a, you know, a large tanker spill or a large blowout than a smaller spill. Um, but I like to also look at that, that, a simpler metric, and that is the response cost per barrel. And there you see an interesting sort of relationship. These very, very small spills, I mean, ones that are, you know, within a facility or something, those are you know, those, those, those are the, the, the per barrel cost is, is pretty, pretty, uh, is, is relatively low and it's pretty, pretty, um, you know, pretty straight, straightforward. As the spill turns into something more complex, this is when, you know, you have to bring in the, the several tiers of responses and all kinds of things happen. It starts getting much more expensive. But then that's, uh, even, even within the, com the complex operation, the per barrel spills then start to go down 
based on the number of, you know, the number of barrels you've spilled. And that's just because you're now taking, you've brought all that equipment in, you've got all those people there, all of that stuff's going on, and you're dividing it over a larger number of barrels and it just sort of spreads it out and you've got an sort of economy of scale going on. Now, one interesting thing that I've seen over the years is that spill response costs, these are uh, per barrel costs now, okay, are increasing at a rate much higher than inflation. Now these are, all, all these costs are in 2021 dollars and these are all the different decades here going across. And if you, if you uh, had, the, if the costs were sort of similar between what, you know, what you had in the 1970s adjusted to 2021 dollars, um, these, these, these bars would all be the same height. But what's going on here is that the cost per barrel is going up, even if you adjust it for inflation. So the green bars, that's, that's the U.S. The orange ones are uh, outside the U.S. And then the gray is just sort of combining the two. It's the worst, the worst case is here in, in the U.S. So I call this inflation plus. It's, it's, it's a, an added, um, and I have to add this into my, my, uh, my cost predictions when people want to know how much that, is that spill going to cost. I take this into account. The kinds of things that, have, that I've seen uh, affecting per barrel spill response costs, um, those costs are increased if you have a small to moderate volume spill on a per barrel basis. Heavier, more persistent oil harder to clean up, sticks around longer, um, it's, it's going to be more expensive. Mechanical recovery increases the cost, greater shoreline impact, proximity to sensitive resources. These are all things that you, you would intuitively guess, and that, and, but it's borne out in the, in the data as well. Uh, there are other things that affect those costs, a politically charged environment, occurrence after a major spill, which probably which loops back to that politically charged environment. Um, if there's a spiller or an R RP with greater resources, the costs go up. And a higher how clean is clean standard also increases, increases the costs, as does the perception or finding of negligence on the part of the RP. Things that decrease costs uh, on a per barrel basis, again, are very large spill volumes, lighter, less persistent oil, a dispersant-based response is less expensive. Uh, the further offshore you are, less shoreline oiling, less expensive. Located outside the U.S., the U.S. is a bad place to have spills in terms of costs. Um, places where you have local, uh, lower local labor costs, it's less expensive. And a greater efficiency of the response will also decrease the costs. So my, I'm, I'm actually currently, I've written a number of papers about spill costs, and I, to be honest, I think that they, those, 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 those earlier, I wouldn't even call them models, but they were, those, those papers have been misused in the literature, they've been misused in litigation and all kinds of things, and I want to sort of set the record straight, so I'm writing a paper to, to, to try to, to bring some better reality to, to spill cost modeling. It's based on that inflation plus um, factor that I showed you earlier. And then other, other factors, oil type, which the sort of more the persistence category of the oil, the spill volume category, and the geographic location. And there's sort of just, just a very, very basic um, drawing of the model. And um, it's, it's based on all kinds of, uh, I mean, case studies that I have, um, as well as, as, you know, literature research and so forth, and a certain amount of expert judgment to come up with a, with a cost that you, can, that you can apply to a potential future spill. Now, you can predict what the spills are going to be, and of course, then the actual cost is sometimes somewhat different, and some of that is going to be based on the effectiveness of the spill response, how good were we at mitigating the damages, the adverse effects. Um, and in some cases, it's chance circumstances. I mean, bad luck, bad timing, you know, whether it's the tourist season or the birds are migrating, a bad political climate. Um, 
occurrence after another major spill, there's this outrage factor that, that you know, comes into play. And then just a really bad location for one or more of these reasons. Well, let's talk about effectiveness of spill response right now. This, you know, our, the main theme of our web, web, uh, webinar series is about spill response. Um, so let's go back to our usual tools in the toolbox. You all know this, um, and I'm gonna focus on mechanical recovery right now. Mechanical recovery, very simply, you know, it has, has significant benefits. Uh, benefits. You can recover oil and, and so that's no longer impacting the environment or causing adverse effects. It's, it has broad stakeholder acceptability. People, you know, believe in it. It has drawbacks. It's labor and, equip, and equipment intensive. There's a lot of work involved and people work very, very hard at it. Um, there's been a general rule of thumb over the years, and I've seen a number of, I saw a number of um, citations about this. The work that I'm about to show you is, is, a, is from a paper that, that uh, I, I wrote with, with Tim, and it was published in Marine Pollution Bulletin in the last few months. If you don't have a copy of that, send me an email. I'll be happy to send you one. And we question the rule of thumb about the 10 to 30% of oil recovered, you know. How reliable is this? Where did this come from? How was it calculated? So first off, how is recovery calculated? I mean, that's, this is, and this is a completely hypothetical example. It just shows you how you can get diff different results based on, on what your, your base assumption is here. I mean, usually, you know, you've got some, you've got, let's say 100,000 barrels filled and we recover, you know, let's say 10 to, to 30,000 barrels of that mechanically. Um, and you know, then you so now you say there's 10 to 30% recovery. But what I also learned in looking at a lot of um, past oil spill data is that the recovery rates aren't necessarily always only the oil recovered. A lot of times you're talking about oil and water, there could be emulsion, it's, it's complicated. I'm not sure that's always all oil. But you can also say, all right, but what could one conceivably recover? I mean, if let's say 40% of the oil evaporates now and you've recovered 10 to 30,000 barrels, well, now you actually have re recovered 17 to 50% of the recoverable oil. Um, so that's another way, another way that people look, might look at that. Oh, there we go. So these are data from the Deepwater Horizon. Um, you get different numbers depending on what, which data you use for how much oil was, was removed, whether you're looking for, at it in terms of what the available data, uh, available uh, oil was, or based on what was originally spilled. And so there are different, these are, there are different studies and this is in this paper as well. And so we got, we got a variety of, of removal rates. If you look at it on the total amount of oil spilled, it's somewhere between 2.7 and 4%. The data are based on field observations and anecdotal data. I mean, people's stories about what, what were recovered. Um, sometimes there's questionable data on the recovered quantities. You know, what is our numerator here? Is it oil? Is it oil and water? Is it oil, water, emulsion? What is it? Um, there can be challenges in determining the, the total amount of oil spilled. I mean, if, if, if oil leaks out of a tanker, we know how much oil there is. If it's coming out of a well, in a well blowout, it's much more complicated, as you know. So, and we also have to consider whether our denominator here is based on the total amount of oil spilled or that recoverable oil. M and most commonly, people are record record uh, reporting the recovered oil as part of the, the overall mass balance, you know, what, what happened to the oil. And so that's, that's, that's based on the total amount that was spilled. So in this study, we looked at, I, I went into my historical data and said, okay, what, what, what can I find here in terms of offshore spills, large offshore spills? So the criteria were at least 10 kilometers from shore, descriptions of response operations were available. Are there, is there information on what was, what the recovery operations were? 
And I limit it to, to cases in which mechanical recovery was conducted, attempted, or considered, and then, and then looked at quantified data on the volumes or percentages of recovery. And I also eliminated um, cases in which it was, you know, the, the, the spill location was in a war zone because, you know, your, your operations would obviously be, be uh, compromised in that case. And I came up with 12 cases in which there was actual mechanical recovery and 18 cases where mechanical recovery was uh, considered or attempted, but where they had zero, essentially 0% 0 recovery. And these are the, the sort of recovery rates that, that we came up with. I mean, it's somewhere between, if you, if you look at it on, based on the total amount of oil spilled, it's somewhere between two and 6%. And if you're basing it on recoverable oil, it's it's about you know 5.6 to 15 percent um, recovery. And there were you know stati statistically significant differences between the recovery weight rates and this our 10 to 30 percent rule of thumb. So we argue that, or I made Tim argue that <laughs> there there is there is that this that rule of thumb ought to be uh, tossed aside. Are we getting better at mechanical recovery? Is that so? I looked at well, is it just over the years are we just getting better at it? And no, there was no significant effect of the time period. Uh, is recovery for offshore spills, uh, you know, closer to shore? Are they more effective? And there was no no effect of the proximity to shore. And of course, that was assuming that ten kilometer minimum. We're not talking about near shore spills. We're talking about offshore spills. So a number of factors that limit offshore mechanical recovery and it basically goes into three groups oil properties and behavior environmental conditions and operational and logistical issues in terms of oil properties and behavior that oil spreads out and thins to you know 0.1 milliliters or meters or less and that reduces the encounter rate that's going to reduce your 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 uh, your capabilities for recovering oil patchiness and drifting of slicks that also reduces that encounter rate viscosity and waxiness reduces skimmer efficiency depending on the oil properties the particular type of oil in that environment and emulsification also increases viscosity and then increases the recovered oil water volume so these are all things that affect what your recovery rate is going to be environmental conditions can have a factor high currents cause entrainment and lower boom effectiveness high winds and sea states, you know, in a off big offshore spill that affects boom effectiveness and operational safety for the responders. High winds are spreading the oil, again, reducing the encounter rate. In an ice and uh, situation, ice and debris can clog skimmers or damage the boom. You can have visibility factors, fog, glare, darkness that can also impede operations. So even if with the best intentions, these are things that you have to contend with. There can be operational and logistical issues. The offshore location relative to the equipment stockpiles and logistical support that affects your operations. You have to keep going back and forth. If you're having to store, you know, store water um, and, and separate it in, in, and you have to have offshore storage capability or if you're moving back and forth with it because you can't decant, cannot decant the, the, uh, the oil, oily water that you've collected. That also can create a bottleneck and reduce your overall efficiency. And then operator skill and experience, the efficiency of aerial support and remote sensing and response management, all of these things affect the overall operational effectiveness. So these three categories of, of, of things will affect how, how effective your, your recovery is. Now, we're not saying that mechanical recovery is not, it doesn't have an important use. We're talking about large offshore spills and that there may be, you know, at least, at least based on the data that we have, it looks like the recovery is, is relatively lim limited. However, for the more common small nearshore spills, mechanical recovery will always be, and, you know, coupled with some man manual methods will always be the best um, approach. Uh, lot logistical support is close by and you don't have as much of an issue with the severe um, environmental conditions. So that takeaway messages are, you know, that you have various things that hamper the effectiveness of the mechanical recovery. 
we, we're see seeing that from for, on, for large offshore spills, you average about two to six percent, or if you, if you want to base it on the recoverable oil, it's six to fifteen percent, but still significantly different than the you know the ten to thirty percent that people had quoted for a long time. So, but this still leaves significant oil in the environment, depending on weathering and other cleanup, and you know. Uh, so for, you know, I, I, I question whether, whether um, mechanical recovery is, is the most effect, effective way to deal with these large offshore spills. But again, mechanical recovery is still going to be the best approach for smaller nearshore spills. So this is, I mean, I, and I've done a number of other types of studies, but this is just sort of focusing on what I've learned from all that spill data that, I, that I've collected over the years and poured over. But, you know, there's, there's a lot that we can do with it, but there are significant gaps in spill data. And I've, I've worked on collecting spill data on an international basis. Um, most of that was, was before I started working on my own because I just didn't have a staff to do all that work. Um, but there are significant challenges. Um, people don't want to share the data. They don't have time to share the data. Uh, and you know, there are all, they're all sorts of reasons that, that it's, it, it gets difficult. There are several approaches you can take. You can, you can deal with the government agencies, um, you know, whether it's the, you know, the people that deal with the spills or, or you know, whether it's their, whatever sort of a, the environmental protection organization or whatever it is. That's agency that that's at the um, that's within the government. That that's one approach. NGOs, non-governmental organizations, collect data. Um, that's another another approach. Although that's usually localized to to very specific areas of interest. Um, and then different sectors of the oil and shipping industries. I mean, you, you know, they they they're tracking what's going on with their you know, with their fleets with their with their um you know with, with their operations and i personally think that the most the most successful way to deal with this was actually to have industry um take the lead on on collecting the data and that the those are people who are in the in the oil industry or or the shipping industry who are, are you know using oil in, in a large way to to as fuel um I think the, the greatest challenges are going to be for the end use industries and those are you know the people who use the oil the store of the oil on their on their facilities because they're they're manufacturing something and that that's going to be harder because that's not that's not of particular interest to them so that's just my my pitch for uh us working to to develop better spill statistics uh for the future um, and maybe fill in some of the gaps we have on, on, on historical spills. But I think it's important because we can learn a great deal from these, from the, the, the data, uh, whether we're analyzing them um, in terms of numbers and trends and, 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 and you know, building little models with them, or whether we're just using those case studies to learn from those. Um, even though you've never been to the same, same spills twice, there are going to be common themes that you get from, from learning from all of these case studies. So that's basically all I have. And I appreciate your listening to me, listening to my story. Um, and I hope that we've, we've got some more stories together for the future. And I wanna thank Tim and uh, Lynn and everyone for, for allowing me this opportunity. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Dagmar, that was, that was, that was great. Should We're I stop to... share now? Or what do we do here? What do we? Well, you can leave it up. There may be a question that. Oh yeah, we can roll back. back. Okay. Slide, so just leave it. <laughs> we can still see okay. you. Okay. And hopefully, you can see me. Um, yep. We're getting some questions, and I'll go through those while they're getting populated. I'll just mention a couple of things and kind of what things that have been interesting or surprising to me as you and I've kind of worked together over the last years. And first is. You know the mechanical recovery estimates were. Uh, I mean, when we started working on that, the goal was to get a sound basis for this rule of thumb um, that we had, and and uh, I think we now question this 10 to 30 percent rule of thumb pretty strongly. And and in fact, the numbers you gave are are likely optimistic because most of the data that you have is oily water collected and not just the oil. And so yeah. that could be nice. I mean, you know, it could be 90 plus percent water. Oh yeah, estimates. So it really, it really kind of drives home the importance of having 
a broad perspective when you're thinking about responding to oil spills um, that are far from shore and uh, far from stockpiles of equipment mm -hmm. and, and, and when they grow in size, right? When they become large spills, right. um, we need to have all tools in the toolbox. And I think that that work that you did is really drives that, um, really drives that home. So it was surprising to me. I expected that we'd come back and the rule of thumb would be validated, but I think mm -hmm. the question, and I, it's important, as you said, many times it's the, what we're talking about is this category. And the reason you only have 30 spills is one reason is there could be a better uh, the database could be made larger by collecting more historical spill mm -hmm. information internationally, but it's also because, you know, thousand plus barrel spills offshore, far offshore are not a common thing, right? So there's just... Thankfully, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, so it means, but as you said, mechanical recovery is still always going to be the most important yeah. um, oil spill response tool because 99.9 .9 or more percent of spills are ones that are very amenable to oil, mm -hmm. to mechanical recovery. The other thing that I thought was the, you showed the graph on the cleanup, cleanup costs. And uh, it's important, I think you mentioned this, but those are just the cleanup costs. It doesn't count NERDA costs, oh, the yeah. damage assessment costs, right? It's just the cleanup costs. And that was maybe one of the even more surprising was <laughs> the, the inflation adjusted cleanup costs. And, and, and we need to think about that and maybe have some ideas, but you know, what's really driving this inflation adjust? Why isn't it a straight a flat line there on, mm -hmm. on top of all of those? I understand the difference between international and, and non-US and all. Yeah, and all there, there is one question about that, which I'll answer in a sec, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. But, but just that is just the cost for going out there and doing the cleanup. It doesn't count the damage assessment costs. And that inflation right. adjusted escalation is right. really something, right? I didn't expect that. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be presenting a paper at, at AMOP actually about looking at trends in NRDA uh, cost yeah. of oil spills. So, yeah, that's coming. Up. But, but I, I think you told me there's not a lot of NRDA. N no, you know, not. there's it. Yeah, I mean, Basically, it's especially. you don't see the same patterns as, as, as with this. And then the third thing is that I hadn't seen this until you showed me your talk last week, but the spills averted, these spills averted estimates. And I think mm -hmm. that's. That's good for somebody that is in the oil industry, at least, because and, and people that are, that help oversee the oil industry. Because, uh, I mean, I, I heard that our previous CEO of Exxon Mobil, he said, every one of us that works for Exxon on Mobil is in the risk reduction business, right? right? And if we're not first in the risk reduction business, all other things are going to go away, right? The mm -hmm. organization wouldn't exist. Um, and so it's good to see that. Uh, you know, the first day you come in the door at ExxonMobil as a new hire, operations integrity is is just drilled into your head, right? Courses on it and the importance of keeping oil in the, you know, inside containers is is everything for the upstream oil business. Um, and so it's good to see that that data is is quite is quite positive, right? On the spills averted, and I think uh, yeah, things would be a lot different if we if we weren't doing better at taking modern electronics, modern analysis tool. And then lessons learned from previous spills to improve our ability to keep oil from coming out of, of containers. So mm -hmm. um, that was a that's a good thing uh, to to see actually. Um, so you can see the questions. I'll, yeah, I'll go through these. And we'll just start going through them, and I'll go in in the order that they came. That's they came fine. Up. Yeah, you yeah, can I'll, see the message. You yeah, got I can nice see them. You want me to just go? I'll, I'll just go through them then. If you don't, if that's yeah, okay. if you want to go through them, yeah, yeah, make sure you read them out and and. That's right. And, I'm going to give a wave to my my esteemed colleague Deborah Schultz. Thank you. <laughs> We've done done. You know, I have to say that one of the things that that has really bothered me over you know the last two two years of COVID is is you know I mean I haven't been able to see some of my family members and so forth. It's been difficult, but. I've also missed my oil, oil spill family and, you know, wait times that we would get together at various conferences and so forth just to catch up on things and brainstorm and learn from each other. I, I really miss that a lot. So I appreciate this, this um, forum to, you know, as one of the ways to, to keep in touch with folks. Uh, Patrick Wong asks, why is the spill cost per barrel much lower outside of the U.S.? Well, there's a couple of things going on here. Um, Good question, and, and you're, you're, you're right, they are, the costs are lower 
Uh, some of it has to, and these are, you know, of course, this is the US and I've averaged all the rest of the world together. Um, it, it, it breaks down differently based on different, different countries and so forth. Uh, the costs are lower. I think in the US, just in terms of the response, we have a, a higher expectation of, of, you know, to, to put it bluntly, of what how clean is clean. And we end up, um, you know, just working really hard at that. And it's expensive. Um, lots of equipment, lots, you know, lots of government oversight, all of those things um, make make the whole the whole process much more um, more expensive. There are actually, you know, certain certain countries in the world where it is very expensive to spill. It's not so the, the average here is not not necessarily reflecting. The, you know, it doesn't mean that every country like that is is that way. But in general, the U.S. in terms of your response cost is the worst place to have a spill. Um, can I list the significant gaps in spill data from past studies on these spills? Okay, I'll tell you, here's what's what's going on. First off. Um, Responsible parties, spillers, you know, are always a little more than a little reluctant to release information about their incidents. And that's because there's litigation going on. There's all kinds of things. And a lot, you know, pe people are, if I can be blunt, they're afraid of people pointing fingers and, and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, proprietary data that you don't necessarily get, get hold of. I've had a lot of access to, to spill cost data because I actually work on a lot of litigation cases where I, where I actually get these data, um, but people don't, but I can't just put that out there obviously because I have non-disclosure agreements too. And so you, you, you sort of, you can kind of hide that in between, you know, without referring to specific spills and you can put those, put those you know, those data into to your, your little calculations, but you can't necessarily reveal what, which particular spills um, had which particular costs. Um, I wish that we could be more in terms of costs. I wish we could be more open about those things, but even in terms of the actual um, spills, uh, we people are not reporting government agencies either you know worldwide don't have the, the 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 time the resources to to be tracking all of these things or to be reporting them to you know somebody like me when i was working with oil spill intelligence report i think they sort of thought this was you know that there was some sort of authority here and they were a little bit more willing to to give the give those data up than they are now um here in the u.s we've had um for a long time, you were able to, to get a lot of the spill data. I used to get data from the Coast Guard and, and I actually analyze it and turn it back and set, sell it back to them or, or give it back to them. Um, but a lot of that has been, um, has been uh, cut back. We don't have the publicly available data. It's very difficult to get it. So it's it's it become it's it's hard to work with some some nations. Canada puts all of its data up there, and if you know what you know, that sometimes it's hard to analyze it because you have to know what you're looking for. Um, but it's you know, it, it, and, and it takes a, a, a lot of work. The, even when you do get when you finally do get the the data, you know, from the Coast Guard or or, or whoever, it's there's a lot of cleaning up that needs to be done of in, in the data itself. Um, Ed, Ed Levine, hi Ed, <laughs> wants, to, um, wants to know how we can fill some of those data gaps for, for previous spills and suggestions for future spills. Well, that actually, I, I, I've been working on a project um, with Tim and, and with, with Dave uh, Palandro, uh, who's, who's over in, 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 at ExxonMobil in, in Qatar, um, on how we might you know, in future, get more data and, and, and so forth. Um, I think there are, you know, I, I mentioned that I think industry is probably um, going to be best able to, to do that. And that may be dividing things into, you know, the oil ex exploration and production, you know, end of the industry versus the tankers versus the pipeline people. I don't know, but somehow th those folks, they are tracking their, their, their spills, but we need to, you know, we need to be able to all have in, in, in some way have access to that so that we can do these types of analyses. Um, so getting some of that stuff out there revealed is, is, is what we need to do. And we need to, to um, think about how we want to continue tracking spills into the future. 
spills have gone down. There aren't as many, you know, cases out there, but but um, there's a lot. If we if we can track, like for example, in the FIMSA data, the pipeline data, there's very specific um, information about how the pipeline spill occurred. You know, what was the cause of it? How old was the pipeline? And all kinds of things. And and the more that sort of data is that that we have, the information about each individual incident gives us more. Um, power to, to, to look at, look at um, trends and try to analyze so what's, going, what's really going on here. What, you know, how can we, wh where should we be putting our prevention, you know, bucks or something like that. Um, and hi, Gina, <laughs> Gina Coelho from Bessie. Um, in regards to spill data needs, any concerns with industry underreporting spill amounts and overreporting spill recovery amounts? Very good question. And I think that that's, you know, that is one of the issues that people um, would have is, you know, you think that a government agency is going to be, they're going to be honest or an NGO, they're going to be honest um, and give you, you know, give you the real facts. Um, whereas industry is going to try to hide it or minimize the amount of oil that was spilled, or I don't know. I mean, I, I, I don't really know what, what to, to say about that. I mean, I think that I mean, Tim, maybe you're better able to address that. I'm sort of coming from the outside here, but it seems to me that, I mean, I always think that that honesty and, and getting the real data there are, is beneficial to everyone because industry also would have an interest in, in understanding the trends and trying to figure out where it, you know, where, what, what it should be doing. Any thoughts on that, Tim? Well, I think it's always something, right? I mean, everybody has comes at everything with a bias and it, it, it sways there. Yeah their ability to, to uh, report this kind of information. I, I think, boy, if it's under-reporting, industry is pretty crummy. I mean, they are over-reporting because we know that these data sets on the recovery amount is oily water, right? right. How much of that is water? So right. they're reporting, but even even with that, it looks it looks bad, right? I yeah, mean, I mean, yeah. This the fraction recovered from mechanical recovery for this category that we analyzed is uh, is extremely is extremely low and you're not doing much in my opinion you're not doing much different than letting mother nature decide what's going to I I was I mean I was in terms of the you know they were talking about under reporting spill amounts and then over reporting spill recovery I mean I I was certainly looking at the historical data that that we analyzed for that mechanical recovery study I was certainly giving them the benefit of the doubt you told me you recovered, you know, X barrels. Oh, oh, okay, you know, but you know, it had it has to sort of be with a little asterisk there, like, well, but that might not not be all all oil, and maybe you know, a good significant part of water. So um, even so, the the numbers came out as they yeah. did. So I don't, you know, I don't think there's been a lot of effort to um, overestimate the amount recovered, other than they, mm -hmm. you know, we we could do a better mm -hmm. job of determining what fraction is oil and what fraction is water. I, the other thing I'd say though, is the database that is primarily US spills that we have um, for this. And I would say that there is a lot of scrutiny over those numbers, right? And so mm -hmm. under reporting amounts is, you, you may not get very far with no. that because it's not, you're not just relying on the, on the responsible party. <laughs> to say here's exactly. a number right it does exactly. not get a lot of scrutiny and a lot of quality control on it so I, i'm not so i'm not so sure internationally is a different in you know spills internationally is a different story and that may yeah. uh, that may have more different sets of challenges and the biases are easier right. to, to maintain gerald graham asks how do we dispel the notion that spills rarely happen here in british columbia for instance on average four thousand marine oil spills are reported to the coast guard each year um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly have, I, I, I've, I've worked, actually worked with, with um, uh, Transport Canada and Canadian Coast Guard, Environment Canada on, 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 on you know, tracking oil spills for, for a, a good while. And I'm aware that there are a lot of spills. I think, I think one of the things that I learned back, you know, back in the, <laughs> when I first started on spills, it's like, wow. I mean, yeah, I heard about the, you know, the Santa Barbara blowout and, you know, and then other, you know, other incidents. Um, but I didn't realize that these things are happening all the time. Now, most of the spills are much smaller, but, um, you know, when I had to go through 
looking, I did a project for EPA, um, well, it was like 20 years ago. Um, you know, I had, I had to look at 155,000 incidents and then try to come up, look at sort of the patterns in those and sort of predict what the costs were and so forth. Um, there are a lot of spills that are happening all the time. Um, the ones that occur that are really big, obviously, are the ones that occur in very sensitive areas, whether it's, you know, and sensitive can just mean politically sensitive. Um, you know, if it happens on a tourist beach or if it happens in a, in a you know, in, in, a, in a marine sanctuary or something where there's a, you know, where there's a particular sensitivity, you're going to hear about those, those more often. But um, no, spills are not, not rare. And we, we still have a lot of work to do in, in reducing, you know, reducing the spills. The, there has been a significant reduction in the spills, but that doesn't mean that, that it's not still a, a, a problem. Um, Jim Peschel, he says, uh, currently the state of Washington is enacting new escort roles for barges to reduce oil spills in the Salish Sea. The review of spill data in Washington state has shown very few, i.e. zero incidents in both quantity and, qu uh, quantity and volume of spills, reduction likely due to prevention measures, methods like double hulls, v uh, vessel traffic service oversight, US Coast Guard and state inspection. Well, a shout out to my friends in Washington state. I've, I've actually done work for, for Washington um, Department of Ecology for, for a good 20 something years. Um, and worked on actually worked on on um, the one of the first tug escort studies out there, and have done all sorts of work on looking at risks of uh, spills in the in the in the Salish Sea, um, Puget Sound, and and uh, we had a workshop. I, I ran a workshop a few years ago where we had people from the Washington State, um, and we had had people from you know folks from from Canada as well as from 23 tribal nations and First Nations uh, talking about ways that we can prevent spills, um, especially from tankers going, going through the Salish Sea. And, and uh, there's been, been a lot of progress there. And yes, vessel traffic service oversight is really important. Uh, inspections and the quality of the vessels. Double hulls is an interesting one. Um, I think a lot of you know people say, oh, we've reduced spills. It's all because of the double hulls. Well, double hulls really only help in certain kinds of incidents. Um, you know, so there, you know, you can, if you're, uh, if you have a, a, a hard collision or a hard grounding, um, it reduces the likelihood that oil is going to, to, um, to uh, you know, escape from the tanker, but it's not, it's not the only reason that we have, that we have um, tanker spills. So it has, has, has had some effect, but yeah, we've been, been very, uh, effective and and uh, Jim, you may may look back on in 2001. I did a uh, wrote a paper with uh, John Neal, who was with with Ecology at the time. He's retired, and and uh, we looked at spill rates at that time. So that's 2001. We were looking at whether regulations in Washington State were effective in reducing uh, tanker spills and vessel spills. So, um, and we did actually find that there was a significant difference between Washington state and other large ports in, in the US. You know, Dagmar, I, I always, we've talked about this before, but I think, I always think of like, I just bought a car for my 16 year old son and that car knows where it is all the time and it knows what's around it all the time. It'll park mm -hmm. itself. It will tell him if he's, it will hit the brakes if he is going to have a front end collision, right? And it'll hit the brakes if he's going to run into something behind him, um, right? That's the electronics that are cheap enough to be put into a car that's cost, you know, low cost as a cost that I can afford, right? It's not a, you know, a multi, multi yeah. hundred million dollar tanker. Um, but those, you know, the GPS coordinate system, every vessel knows where it is and it should know where every other vessel is almost on the entire planet at every moment, right? There's yeah. systems that allow that to happen. And it knows where hazards are and it knows where it is in relation to hazards, right? It doesn't necessarily need the pilot to be on the, you know, on the deck, on the, on the bridge guiding it, although they are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but that, those kinds of things, those kinds yeah. of advances in technology in addition to the other things you mentioned, I think has to be um, a key component of why tanker oh. incidents 
Sure. Oh yeah, I mean we've uh, we've seen. Right. I've done I've done a lot of uh, vessel traffic studies, and so one of those fault tree sort of things is like looking at how likely are we. You know, we want to ultimately know how likely is a spill to happen, but first we have to go back. How likely are you to have the accident that may re- or the error that may lead to the spill? And and yeah. in that, I've had to look at a lot of uh, you know vessel casualty studies and rates of. And, and I've actually spent time on the bridges of vessels, looking you know just sort of. I just want to see what they're doing. What are they? Yeah. What kind of information do they have? And it's, it's actually pretty amazing. And we have reduced accidents significantly um, yep. with, with a lot of that technology. Yeah, and I'll, look, I'll just add this really quickly. My so my daughter, I bought her the same kind of car that has all this collision avoidance stuff, right? It, It'll hit the brakes if she's not paying attention. It will keep her from going into a lane if there's a car in the lane. Uh, at least it'll give her an alarm. And I bought that car for her when she turned 16, which was four years ago. All None of her friends had cars that had the capability on it. Every one of them luckily didn't have serious accidents, but they all had accidents. They all had fender benders. They all ran into things. Every one of her friends had them. And I'm like, I, you know, I told her once, I go, you guys, your friends are not very good drivers and you are a good driver. And she said, dad, it's not because I'm a good driver. It's because that car has kept me, has kept her out of accidents. Wow. And we paid more money for that car, but I don't, you know, that's money. Well, that was yeah. money well yeah. spent though. So anyone who has, because I was a teenager and when I was 16, I had two very terrible, you know, bad accidents. Luckily I wasn't hurt, um, but I know what a teenage boy um, is like when you put them behind the wheel of a car. And so uh, these modern technologies that are available, so tankers and other ships, um, but even available in cars that you can buy yeah. nowadays are worth every every extra penny that you have to pay uh, for the car. Ken Lee asks, do I, for- hi Ken, uh, do you foresee any technological advances in the near future increasing efficiency and reducing costs? I'm assuming of, um, of- response um well <laughs> i know that i know dispersants bring down the, the costs um you know in terms of are we talking about increased in fit efficiency of, of mechanical recovery or you know i mean i suppose um you know there are there are people who are working on on you know increasing increasing uh you know mechanical recovery effectiveness certain certain um technological advances there although I looking I mean I and I admit you know we have a relatively small data set but that's that's for you know people who were actually reporting the recovery there was no uh, change over time so it wasn't like in the 70s we weren't really good at it now that you know in 2010 we're, we're getting better at it there really was not that much difference so um but you know, but there are for certain types of situations, there, there are certainly people who are working all the time to try to increase the efficiency of, of the mechanical recovery. And in, re- in terms of reducing costs, I mean, costs is that's you know, the more efficient you are, the, the less oil that spreads onto the shoreline and, and so forth, the, you know, the better your, your the lower your costs are going to be. Um, but you know, some of those some of those costs are sort of o- overhead costs, you know, of, of, of uh, people supervising it and so forth. Um, so I don't really know necessarily whether it's going to reduce costs, but we may um, reduce efficiency. Al Allen. Hi, Al. <laughs> um, can I c- comment on the comparative cost for elimination of available spilled oil using mechanical dispersant application and controlled burning? Granted, there are fewer spills for comparison with dispersants and especially in to burning. Have you done some analyses on data available? Yeah, I've got, I mean, we have, we have, I have data on, um, you know, other the, the sort of the costs, like, for example, I can tell you that, that um, in, in general, the costs per barrel are going to be, you know, less expensive for um, if you're using uh, dispersants. And in fact, some of the, some of the, the, the reduced costs for, for some of the earlier spills outside the U.S. Um, was because dispersants were being used actually um burning too yeah i mean we don't have that many cases um to to deal with and i think what you're getting at in in terms of you know the comparative cost for the elimination of the available spilled oil i mean with with deep water horizon we had every i mean every conceivable kind of 
you know, response going on out there simultaneously. And so now taking, you know, there were, I, I, and, you know, and, and I had actually initially, Tim, if you remember, I had said, all right, well, let's, let's look at the, you know, how much oil was spilled at Deepwater Horizon. Let's break it down into what was available after some of it had been burned, after some of it had been mechanical recovered, like sort of separating out all the, the oil that was available to all the different types of response and how, and so it, it was, you know, quite complex. And, and I think we, we decided to, to move away from that and, and, you know, maybe look at that at a different time, but that, that, you know, it, it is complicated to look at, well, what oil is actually available for different types of recovery when you have a really complex operation like that. So uh, yeah, that, that needs, that, that can be looked at more carefully. Hey, let me, let me, before you go on the next one, let me yeah, yeah, yeah. say something about Ken's question. And I'll oh, just Ken, put a yeah. plug in. Thank he knows you. this because I do this all the time, but I increased efficiency, reducing costs is secondary because when a spill happens, costs are set, ter you know, tertiary. Mm -hmm. um, but increasing efficiency, I think, is, uh, you know, mechanical recovery is going to require a little bit of men to come down from outer space and tell us how to break the laws of physics because it's the, it's the challenges of keeping oil in and collecting oil quickly in booms, right? I think if we could do that more efficiently, we could skim it out quickly enough to, right? there's been big advances in skimmers, um, but just the physics of, of oil, keeping oil in booms, in a, in an, especially in the ocean, but in rivers and other things. And what is, about decanting? Is, decanting is, you know, advances in decanting, but I, I would say that's not the rate limiting mm -hmm. challenge. And, you know, advances like the, uh, the Bessie burner is an important, tool mm -hmm. and, and right. the use of something that uh, that eliminates the, the logistical challenges and frees up vessels that would be used you know um, ferrying oily water um, back and forth to sh from shore is is you know something like the Bessie burner is an important mm -hmm. advance and it needs to be there needs to be an advocacy effort to make that uh, uh, an option right and and that eliminates the oil at at or near the source is one thing, but what I was going to mention in, in addition to that. So there's, there are some things where I think mechanical re recovery can be in, improved. And the Bessie burner is one thing to reduce mm -hmm. downstream logistics. Uh, and then, then the, where, you know, where the waste oil goes and all of the fate of it. Um, but uh, for increasing efficiency, the one thing I'll plug, and I, I try to do as much as possible because I think everyone should know about it. And I, but it's, uh, it's using herders and burning the yeah. oil in situ burning has only been used one time offshore as an operational oil spill tool. And that's during the deep water horizon is because of the nature of that spill, mm -hmm. the oil coming up every day and its ability to marshal all these resources to do it and get the expert out there like Al Allen um, to oversee it and make it even more efficient. Um, but that's only one operational. There's only one data point for an offshore oil yeah. spill that uses in situ burning. Um, herders, and followed by in situ burning will allow in situ burning to be performed and, and the tools we're developing for it will be you can do in situ burning at the speed of at least a helicopter and hopefully we'll advance it enough to be at the speed of a fixed wing aircraft. That means speed, it, in situ burning will be on the same kind of level playing field with, with dispersants as far as speed and speed is the key to offshore oil spill response and getting out to the spill quickly and then moving amongst oil slicks that might be just a few kilometers apart. But doing that in an aircraft is, is simple and fast. Doing that in boat is slow, especially yeah. when you're pulling a boom along. Yeah. along. So I, th I think those things and, you know, and, and the advocacy and, and the acceptance of these tools herders, the Bessie burner, and there may be some other things that are coming. Um, are, uh, right, it's, it's, one, it's, it's one thing to develop these tools, um, but it's another thing to get them accepted in an environment where spills don't, that need those tools aren't used, don't happen frequently, right? And then the ability right. to go out and test them in the field during a planned release is, is very limited uh, these days as, as well. So, uh, so there is there is hope, but it is a slow a slow process, mm -hmm. both in development of these tools, but also in in the acceptance by the the decision makers for for allowing these tools to be used. And you need all of those things because it's, you know getting those that equipment into uh, into stockpiles so they're ready to be used right. uh, requires that the person who's paying for the stockpile is knows that 
that stuff is going to be accepted and be usable, right? So yeah, there's a lot of very good point. Mm -hmm. So Dave Dickens, hi Dave, <laughs> says um, any thoughts on on producing a companion piece to the mechanical recovery paper that focuses on spills where dispersant were applied. Uh, is there enough data to make such a comparison possible? Yeah, I'd love to do it. <laughs> so it's, I think we, you know, we do have, we, we you know, we, we do have um, probably enough data to, to do that. I mean, I certainly, in terms of costs, I had, I mean, this, it was even a number of years ago, looked at the, the costs sort of per barrel, uh, for, for dispersants versus mechanical recovery and so forth. But, and we, and since then we have, we have a lot more data to work with. So that would, that would be an interesting, um, interesting comparison. Yeah, I, I think the key thing would be how much, you know, the treatment differences, right? right? right. If you consider right. recovering the barrel oil treating, um, yeah. how, much, how much more efficient can we be treating oil with alternative, with other yeah. response options besides, right. that would be, let's, let's put that on our chalkboard. Okay, that's Thank good. You. Fred Maya asks, uh, in small spills, isn't the best way to use dispersants the great difficulty in maybe in environmental restrictions, but I understand that the impact of oil plus dispersant will be less than when oil reaches the shore by only 6% could be recovered mechanically. Um, so it's small spills, I mean like a small spill offshore or uh, are we talking about small spills? I mean, certainly, you know, a smaller spill offshore. Um, if I would think, if you know, if it if it's logistically possible to treat it with with um, with dispersants, yeah, I would. I think that that would be more effective than than you know trying to to recover it mechanically. Um, but I don't know whether we're talking here about um, nearshore you know, near shore use or, 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 you know, inland waterway use of, of, of dispersants. Um, you know, I, I yeah, I, I think dispersants for small spills is always going to be a challenge. There may be specific scenarios, yeah. right. Where you're, you're near a, some sensitive habitat that, that, you know, is going to have damage from, from, from a spill of oil, from an oil slip coming up the tropic study is an important one. I think we're gonna have a talk on the topic tropic study in a few months by uh, Tony Knapp. But mm -hmm. the tropic study is an example of a small spill going into a mangrove and causing, you know, it's immediate damage when an oil slick covers the, uh, the, uh, the, covers the roots of the mangroves and they're done, right? And they lose their ability to maintain the sediment in place. And yeah. that starts affecting the, even the part of the environment you thought you were protecting by not applying dispersants, right? The increased sediment load changes the clarity of the water and the corals that are just offshore um, don't like that. And so that's a specific, you know, there could be case by case yeah. spills where dispersants could be, but I think in general, dispersants are always gonna be challenged to, uh, for small spills um, because just the impacts from small spills, right? Mother nature is able yes. to deal with oil in the environment. Yeah. I always tell people this, if it wasn't for the, if it wasn't for petroleum degrading microorganisms in all marine environments, and in fact, all environments that ever been, that have been yep. diligently looked into, if it wasn't for those petroleum degrading microorganisms, we, I wouldn't go down to Galveston Beach with my family. I'd go down to Galveston Asphalt Road, right? It would look right. like the <laughs> oil would come ashore eventually, it, but it wouldn't be oil anymore. It would be the heavy components, just like the tar that's used. Mm -hmm. And so we wouldn't have sand covered beaches, we'd have asphalt covered um, covered beaches. So small spills, you know, if eliminating, reducing spills is, is, is a key thing because certainly there's nothing good about it, but mother nature has the ability to deal with mm -hmm. uh, oil in the environment. Yeah, uh, Dave, Dave Dickens also asked whether whether in situ burning one, one could do a you know a, a sort of analysis of that. We just don't have that many cases, but yeah, you you know in terms of, of efficiency and so forth, we can certainly you know look at that. Um, Jim Pichel, the lack of data in Washington, they've cherry picked international spills to justify the need for enacting new rules. No one wants a spill, but it's expensive to enact additional preventive step when the steps when the denominator is already zero over the past 20 plus years. 
Wow, this this actually hits home. I did a when I was doing a um, environmental impact analysis. I think this was on the Gateway Pacific Terminal in the in uh, Puget Sound there in Salish Sea. You know, we had to look at sort of predict what was the likelihood of accidents and and all. I was working with with Gloston um, Engineering, um, and we were looking at how likely are there to be you know spills in different locations and different accidents and so forth. And looking at historical data, well, there hadn't been any, or you know, it's just so. So then we had to, you know, decide. Well, do you just sort of assume that there's one or, or zero or what? It it it's it is a it's a complicated um statistical problem and and it you know may, each one of those accidents maybe in that case are, are kind of outlier events just like you know the deep water horizon it's 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 something that's happening you know i don't know on a on a like you know a hundred year scale or something like that and we're now looking at a smaller scale and if it just happens to happen during that time period then you know you've had bad luck, but if you're looking at any of the other points during that hundred years, it's not going to happen. It it, it it it's a it's actually a complicated uh, statistical uh, nightmare <laughs> sometimes in trying to figure out how how to fit that in. But um, you know people are always you know do do you want to prepare? Do we need to prepare for another? Um, you know, major blowout like Deepwater Horizon is it likely to happen again in the next few years. Uh, should we be preparing for it? Sometimes you have to think about, you know, whether on the consequence side, if the consequences would be so bad that then that you want to do what you can to pre prevent that un very unlikely uh, but high consequence event from happening. That that's another another consideration uh, that that comes into play in the risk assessment. Um, oh, Alan Mearns. Hello, Alan. <laughs> Dagmar, it, it, we're getting close to. Yeah, we get, we get, oh, sorry. Yeah, mm, we got to let people go. Uh, I, I think I, it might be. Yeah, if there's a, another question, if you want to look down the list and see. If I'll, I'll, I'll sort of look quickly. Yeah, um, and that you want to. Yeah, and, let's see. Al, Al, uh, Alan Mearns asked can, whether yeah. ITOP has attempted similar analyses. Um, ITOP tracks tanker spills and um, they put out their their annual uh, stats on that they won't will not, will not share their database um, but they will they will tell you how many tanker spills there were and they also and they actually also track um, non-tank vessels but they do not release those data that's just for their internal um, use I don't and, and in terms of I'm not sure if he's looking at spill stats, talking about statistics or trends or whether he's talking about costs. ITOP, uh, yeah, there are some papers if you look back, um, some of the ITOP um, papers on, on, on spill costs because they work with closely with IOPC fund. On, yeah, on yes, yeah, I, see, I see Al is correcting me, but I'm, I'm going to recorrect Al. I, what I said is Deepwater Horizon was the only time in situ burning has been an operational oil spill response option. I know about the Prince William Sound. Yeah. WS spill. Um, and that was a test, you know, one burn. Um, it wasn't operate, it wasn't an operational tool during that spill. Deepwater mm -hmm. Horizon is the only spill where it was an operational, where it was an operational tool. Yeah, so if you um, see when we're getting close to the end. Yeah, Ed, Ed's, Ed Levine is just reminding everybody that the uh, National Academy of Sciences Oil in the Sea 4 report, I'm on the committee um, with that. That'll be coming out uh, sometime this summer. Uh, something to look forward to, looking at at uh, spill trends and and looking at at you know some of the latest research on 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 oil spill effects. Um, I'm going to keep going, Dagmar. It's, we still yeah, have yeah. 50 people. If you want to just go down the list and we'll okay, get... all right. The resource document and number of spills, types of pop. Okay, I'm not sure. Oh, there, yeah. Oil spill task force. Yeah, I'm familiar with their work. Um, one of the pe people often say, "Oh, here's a you know here's a here's a report or something." And, and the problem with that is that if it's aggregated data, if they're aggregate, you know, like here are the number of spills or here's the volume or something like that. If I can't break it down, uh, it's harder to look at trends. 
So if I don't know what, you know, if I, I like to look at individual incidents because then I can break it out the way I want to in terms of what, what, what I'm specifically looking at rather than, you know, here's the number of incidents. And when people talk about the number of incidents, they're often talking about spills of different volumes and have different thresholds. And we have to be really careful in combining different aggregated studies. Um, so, so somebody was saying, Gabriel Vlad, uh, well, but, uh, conventional technology, you know, we can't necessarily, you know, a large oil spills keep occurring. The conventional technologies developed uh, to respond to spills in temperate waters such as the Gulf of Mexico are strictly conditioned by weather and do not apply in the hurricane season while simply being not transferable to the Arctic region. Um, yeah, there, I mean, there are, there are, the Arctic presents, you know, a, a lot of its own challenges. I'm wondering whether David Dickens is going to talk about that in, <laughs> in a couple of months. Maybe. maybe. Um, but, um, uh, you know, on that question, I mean, look, we, there's a lot of effort put into enhancing. Sure. That's the reason my job exists. Um, but Bessie has a large um, pool of funds. <clears throat> to do resource and they they have a folk they have a focus on arctic and so you know we haven't solved we haven't solved the problem um mm -hmm. hurricanes i'm not you know i'm not sure if we need equipment that allows us to do well for response in hurricanes for example because a hurricane is going to cause almost all oils to completely disperse there's so much mixing energy that that oil slicks will not be on the water surface after a, a hurricane um, so there's not much that you could do mm -hmm other than keep the spill from happening um, in the first first place but you yeah. know we are I'm, I, I have a job and my job is to enhance capabilities for oil spill response and we think about all the challenges that are listed there Tom Coolbaugh is saying you know they're they're they reg, you know working at at, uh, at Omset you know regularly see attempts to increase mechanical recovery um, you know, with, with uh, groove and fuzzy skimmers and all sorts of things. So there have been, you know, certainly some, some uh, changes there. And, and, you know, if you keep up with, uh, with the reports of the testing that, that they're doing there, you might see some, some, um, some technological changes. Um, for smaller spills under seven tons, it makes sense to have containment assets on board, like portable fire extinguishers, but for oil spills, not to replace Osro's, but deploy containment when safe for Osro. I mean, it's, it, I believe vessels uh, generally have uh, equipment for for you know for for smaller spills. I don't know. I mean, certainly anything that's like on the vessel itself, they have they have you know. Well, you know that I think that question is exactly what we ask you to help us determine, right? Mm, ah. Right. Do we we do risk assessments to understand there's you know, it's not just, <clears throat> you know, put equipment out on a on the bow of a tanker and and you got the risk reduced. Right. It's it's you know, is it is it justified in the first place? I mean, mm -hmm. the data shows that tankers aren't spilling and what would you know, assets on board the tanker, what would that do uh, in the first place? But it's not a, it's not a zero risk. Right. If you put assets on a tanker, you got to train the you got to train the crew to use those assets and just the fact of you know there's just the risk of of that kind of thing deploying equipment into the sea to put containment out for people whose day job is steering a tanker yeah. um, that, that may you know because of the type of information we get from somebody like dagmar mm -hmm. the risk and the risk reduction from from putting that kind of equipment on on every asset so we do use her analysis to decide where the equipment should be stockpiled, right? Obviously, right. where the risk is the highest, where the probability is the, and times of consequences is high enough. And so uh, right. putting it everywhere, you know, might make sense into some, in some analysis, but the, the risk of having equipment everywhere is that it has to be maintained, right. and deployed and drilled right. and tested and trained. Right. And those, those things cause their own, own risk. Putting people on the water to deploy mm -hmm. boom is not yeah. a zero risk um, yeah. operation. So, 
Exactly. And then I, you know, I, you, you, you know, at some point you, you, there's, you know, well, what, what benefit are you going to have? You know, I mean, you can, the people have said, well, we should, if you, if you have booms all along the shoreline. Well, you're not going to have any, you know, shoreline oiling, but you know, is that really the best way for you to be, to be, you know, place to be putting your resources and, and you're right there. I mean, spill response is not, is, is and it's dangerous. I mean, people, yeah, you know, it's dangerous, but in fact, the, the crew of those vessels should probably put their effort into stopping the oil from coming out of the vessel in the first right. place or ensuring that the vessel is not going to continue to go into the rocks or whatever is yeah, causing yeah. the incident and, 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 and telling them they need to also go out and respond to what's on the water yeah. is, may not be the way to reduce risk. So all those kind of things go into, right. you know, it's decisions about where to place equipment stockpiles. Exactly. I mean, I always, I always advocate for stepping back and looking at the whole picture. What, what are all the different moving parts here and where can you focus your attention? And, and you're right. I mean, certainly keeping the oil in the container is the, is our first, is the first, um, you know, fo focus that we should have. And, and, and so, you know, I'm not sure whether having, you know, having booms and skimmers or small skimming <laughs> or pumping devices on the vessel is gonna, is gonna you know, <laughs> better, better to prevent the, the spill in the first place. Um, the Al Collectrex, my recorrection. Yeah, I, I, okay, I, I don't yeah. think of a one, one burn as the operational burn. I, it was a great thing and I don't yeah. discount it, but. Uh, we, I think that's, know, I think that's what Al talked to me about the first time I interviewed him was that, was that experience. Well, we did talk about in situ burning. That was, that was actually our first time. What, what we did <laughs> operate. I think we have a different understanding of operational. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Greg McCown from OSPR. I think the best way to increase efficiency and reduce overall response costs is to compress the response time. Automatic leak spill detection systems and automatic shutdown systems allow responders to get whatever tools are appropriate to the spill when they think they can do the most good. There is growth in these technologies, I think. Yeah, I mean, getting there faster is, you know, that's always that in any way that you can, you know, detect the spill happening, get your spill, you know, get the, A, stop the spill, the oil from, from spilling, reduce your, you know, do your source control and then get there and respond more quickly. I mean, you're, you become less and less and less and less efficient over time and you're spending more and more and more money and more and more resources. Um, you know, so if you can do it quickly, yeah, that, that is, that would be the best way to go. Um, and, and, and I'll just tell you inside Exxon Mobil, I'm sure all of industry, but leak detection, pipeline leak detection, there's whole teams looking at how to do that. The chat, one yeah. of the challenges there is false positives, right? And the, and the, and the issues related to, to false positives. Um, but there is work to enhance those tools. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's been a, a big advances in, in deployment of, of to tools, tools to do those kinds of things. We're looking at tools to do remote detection with a uh, remotely operated um, vehicle that can get us out, get eyes out on the on the on oil spills way offshore or where wherever fast, and so uh, decisions can be made about what the you know how to do tactical and strategic response mm -hmm. um, as well. So there is, I, I think, there's a lot of advances that have happened in a lot of areas, right? And, and just mm -hmm. the growth of the ability to know where a tanker is with GPS and all the other electronic systems on there to avoid collisions um, and advances in, in the capability to do leak detection and the remote sensing. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of improvement and I, th I think I'm very positive about the next say decade or so of our mm -hmm. ability to do things better than we have for the last 30 years, yep. 40 years, 50 years. Yeah, no, that's, that's true. Oh, and, and Jackie's there. Hi, Jackie. <laughs> I, I've learned a great deal from you and it, it's been, it's been, you know, I, I, it, I mean, it, one of the things that I, as I said, I, you know, there have just been I, my experiences and working with, you know, a number of the people who are, who are, I've asked questions here and who I know are, are listening and, and, and other folks, we, I've just learned so much from, from everyone. And I, and I have appreciated the, the, the sort of oil spill family that we have. Okay. Are we 
Did we make it? I think that's it. Yeah. All right. Okay. Well, thanks. And there's still some people that hung on, so you're not talking. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Thank, thank you for, so, for staying. I, here. I enjoyed the talk, and I always enjoy that these presentations. You did a great job. Thank you. And I enjoy the kind of discussion. The questions get answered, and then the, the discussion that we um, that we have. And uh, today was no exception. So thanks, thanks. I know this is not uh, something that you just wake up and do. And you right. <laughs> Slide, so I really appreciate <laughs> Thank you. your effort. Thank today. you. And as I said, you are a you are a friend of the webinar. Thank so, you so much. I, I thank thank you for inviting me. And Lynn, I hope you feel better real soon. <laughs> but I think Tim did a good job controlling controlling the things here, so it worked out okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, All right. Bye bye. <laughs>